Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans Ensue with Mary San Giovanni! Folks, welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. I'm Mary San Giovanni, up to shenanigans once again of cosmic proportions. For our 30th episode, as well as our 31st actually, we'll be discussing a two part history of one of Cosmic Horror's cornerstone magazines, Weird Tales. This, was, this magazine was founded in late 1922 by J.C. Henneberger and his fraternity brother, J.M. Langs. Lang Singer, wow, I'm screwing this up already. Through their company, Rural Publishing Corporation, the magazine published fantasy and horror pulp fiction from some of the foremost writers of cosmic horror and weird fiction, notably H.P. Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith, Robert E. Howard, and many others. So we're going to take a sort of retrospective look at Weird Tales and its effect on cosmic horror as a whole. Weird Tales' first issue, dated March 1923, appeared on newsstands on February 18th for only 25 cents. It was considered an expensive magazine at the time, as most magazines, according to Robert Block, were about a dime. Uh, This particular issue, which you can find the table of contents on Google for, which I thought is is just so cool, uh, featured stories by Julian Kilman, Orville R. Emerson, Joel Townsley Rogers, Brian Irvine, G. Wells, David R. Solomon, Merlin Moore Taylor, Farnsworth Wright, Howard Ellis Davis, Herbert J. Mangum, Meredith Davis, Walter Scott Story, W. H. Holmes, R. T. M. Scott, an anonymous story called The Young Man Who Wanted to Die, William Sanford, Joseph Faust, and James Bennett Wooding. They wrote a story together. Captain James Warburton, Lewis, F. Georgia Stroop, I. W. D. Peters, Harold Ward, and James B. M. Clark, Jr. There were also three novelettes, one by William E. Hawkins, one by Anthony M. Rudd, which is considered one of the more popular novelettes of the issue, and Hamilton Craigie. There was also a two-part novel by Otis Adelbert Klein, which was also considered one of the highlights of the magazine. There was also, of course, a letters column called The Eerie, which was overseen by the magazine's first editor, Edwin Baird. And as they say on the table of contents page, quote, also a number of odd facts and queer fancies crowded in for good measure. Now, within the first year, the magazine saw financial trouble. Uh, And this was going to be a persistent theme with Weird Tales throughout its entire history. But within this first year, Henneberger sold his interest in the publisher, Rural Publishing Corporation, to Lansinger. And then he refinanced Weird Tales uh, with contributor Farnsworth Wright as the new editor. Wright's first issue was dated November 1924, and he held the reins of editorship for the next 15 years. It's considered that under Wright's editorship, the magazine flourished. Now, in talking about how uh, monumental this magazine is in having influenced cosmic horror and really been the, the place for this kind of fiction to be published, we have Lovecraft's first mythos story The first mythos story to appear in Weird Tales was The Call of Cthulhu in 1928. It was not his first story in the magazine, but his first mythos story. Uh, In December of 1932, Robert E. Howard's first Conan story appeared. Seabury Quinn's famous occult detective, and also a New Jersey native, woohoo, Jules de Grandin, and his Dr. Watson of sorts, Dr. Trowbridge, first appeared in Weird Tales, I believe, in January of 1928. That's what the the research seems to show. Uh, That was also incredibly popular. Uh, People, even back in the 1920s, loved occult detectives. And we're seeing a resurgence of that nowadays. The first issue 10-year-old Robert Block ever read of Weird Tales was the August 1927 issue. His aunt bought it for him. She was shocked by the magazine that he chose, but 
uh, she had offered to buy him a magazine, and that's the one he picked. He read his first Lovecraft story, Pickman's Model, in the October issue of that year. And then, six weeks after graduating high school in 1934, he sold his first short story to Weird Tales. Actually, his first publication in Weird Tales was in its letter column. It was a letter that criticized the Conan stories of Robert E. Howard. However, his first professional sales, there were two of them, at the age of 17, this would have been in July of 1934 when he sold them, were the stories The Feast in the Abbey, which appeared in the January 1935 issue, and The Secret in the Tomb, which subsequently appeared in the May 1935 issue. Uh, so this 15-year reign of Weird Tales under Wright uh, was going pretty well when his Parkinson's took a downturn. Uh, Editor Farnsworth writes Parkinson's illness had been causing a steady decline in his health over the last 10 years. It had reached a stage where he could barely walk on his own and he was having a lot of trouble um, and, and couldn't really continue to be the editor at Weird Tales. The publisher of Short Stories magazine, William Delaney, bought Weird Tales in 1938. Within two years of that, uh, Wright was no longer able to uh, perform editorial duties. Uh, he died shortly thereafter, I believe within two years after that, uh, following complications of a surgery that he had to relieve some of these Parkinson's symptoms. Uh, Dorothy McElrath took over as editor. Now, critics believe the magazine declined under her editorship. And I've got to tell you, when I first read that, I bristled a little bit because I thought, okay, now, um, because it's a woman taking over, there's an issue there. But that's not it at all, okay? Uh, Weird Tales, as I, as I was looking over this, Weird Tales had a habit of publishing both women and also, uh, well, it had a habit of publishing women. It also had a habit of looking to women for editorial direction. And I think that that's, uh, that's worth noting about Weird Tales. The issue with Dorothy McElrath taking over as editor, according to critics, is that despite publishing emerging greats like Ray Bradbury, uh, it lacked a certain originality that that maybe um, she stuck too hard to the to the uh, essential gothic horror ghost stories instead of branching out and trying original material. This would be honestly uh, in in slight contradiction to what I just said, this would be an issue with Weird Tales on and off throughout its history. In 1954, however, after uh, a steady decline in sales of Weird Tales, it ceased publication. Uh, there were attempts to relaunch the magazine, but it wasn't until 1988, though, that the magazine ran more or less steadily for a good 20 years uh, under an assortment of publishers and with a brief name change, which we're going to discuss more in part two of this particular uh, two-part series. Now, one of the things I wanted to note about Weird Tales, which I thought was interesting, is that initially the payment rates were low for the magazine. And, and they were considered low at the time. So writers take note of this, okay? The payment rates that were offered were a quarter to a half cent a word. That was the going rate until about 1926 when their publishing, they had paid off some of their debts and it allowed them to offer the most popular writers one cent a word. Think about that. That was the going rate in 1926. Okay. And I say this because the, the professional rate, according to today's standards, when I started, it was three cents a word. Then it was moved up to five cents a word. I, I believe now the the minimum wage payment rate for you know lack of a better way to say it is about six cents a word. So just keep that in mind that that if you're that at the time professional writers thought one cent a word was low, that it was a low payment rate considering the fantasy and science fiction magazines at the time and what they were offering. Uh, and as I mentioned before, once some of its debts were paid off. The magazine finally began offering one and a half cents a word, okay, after this one cent a word bump. Um, but still, it was also considered a low rate. 
its popularity took a while to get off the ground as well. As I, I, as I believe I mentioned, there weren't a whole lot of avenues for people to publish weird fiction. And in fact, you know, some of the more uh, prominent writers of the time had been complaining that there wasn't really a good avenue for this. And it's one of the reasons Henneberger opened Weird Tales in addition to, you know, detective stories and things like that. That was, he was hoping to have a forum for fantasy and horror. Um, however, as I, as I said, the, the, the popularity of this magazine took a while to get off the ground. And they tried experimenting with some things. They changed the format of um, the size from standard pulp size to a large pulp size. Henneberger thought that might increase the magazine's visibility. However, it was only with the first issue with the new size, this May 1923 issue, that was the only one that sold out completely. Okay, so there was always a little bit of, of trouble in, uh, in sales with this particular magazine. According to online resources, uh, it said that the magazine incurred a debt over 13 issues of about $40,000 under Baird's editorship. This is $40,000 in the 1920s, so that's a lot of money. Uh, most of which was owed to the magazine's printer. Uh, it was this debt, though, which caused Henneberger to sell both Weird Tales and his other magazine that he, that he owned, Detective Tales, and invest the money in Weird Tales. Now, this didn't pay off all of the debt, so he made an agreement with B. Cornelius of the printing company to convert the debt into majority interest in a new company called Popular Fiction Publishing. Now, I don't understand all of the financial aspects of that information, I'm not going to lie. But to put it simply, what he did in refinancing all of this meant that Weird Tales could continue to publish stories. Now, another interesting factoid, if you will, is that uh, during this time, Henneberger spent a good amount of effort in trying to get Lovecraft to agree to take over as editor uh, when uh, he could no longer, when Baird could no longer do it. And ultimately the job was offered to write. They don't know if it was because Lovecraft eventually turned it down or Henneberger got tired of, of badgering Lovecraft into doing it and just not getting an answer. But Lovecraft at the time hemmed and hawed because he didn't want to uproot his new wife. They were living in New York and he didn't want to move. And he didn't like the cold. And he would have had to have moved to Chicago in order to assume the, the editor role of Weird Tales. At the time, uh, the Weird Tales offices were in Chicago. Lovecraft did describe Weird Tales to Frank Belknap Long in a letter, though, as, quote, a brand new magazine to cover the field of Poe Machin shutters. So he was excited about the magazine, and I think it was Henneberger's talking it up that probably led to his submitting stories to it. Now, according to an online resource, Robert Weinberg, the author of A History of Weird Tales, and also uh, a partial owner at some point in, in Weird Tales' future, uh, he recounts a rumor that Wright was unpaid for much of his work on the magazine. But according to E. Hoffman Price, who was a close friend of Wright's and who occasionally read manuscripts for him and also was an occasional contributor to Weird Tales, um, he said Weird Tales was paying Wright about $600 a month in 1927. Um, so Wright, I, I think, you know, he did this because he loved it and because he loved editing, you know, and, um, and I guess because, you know, he's getting paid for it. Now, it doesn't mean that this is a lucrative business, okay? And for being such a cornerstone market, uh, Weird Tales was often plagued with odd troubles. In 1927, Popular Fiction Publishing issued Birch's The Moon Terror. This was one of Weird Tales' more popular serials. They, uh, a lot of the magazines at the time included more than just fiction, um, or, and they included you know, nonfiction and poetry and essays and reviews. Uh, and when they did include fiction, they didn't just include short fiction. A lot of times they serialized longer works. So they published this Moon Terror, which was one of the most popular serials in Weird Tales, as a hardcover book. And they included three other stories from the magazine's first year. 
One of the stories, An Adventure in the Fourth Dimension, was by Wright himself. However, the book sold poorly, and it remained on offer in the pages of Weird Tales at reduced prices for about 20 years. Okay. So now we jump to McElwraith's first issue. That was dated April 1940. She was assisted by Lamont Buchanan, who worked for her as associate editor and art editor for both Weird Tales and short stories. Okay. Short stories made a lot more money than Weird Tales. And I think that because of that, McElroy's hands were a little bit tied when it came to uh, soliciting fiction for Weird Tales. Now, August Derleth at this time also provided assistance and advice, although he had no formal connection with the magazine. Now, again, for those writers following along, the payment rate for fiction in Weird Tales by 1953 was one cent per word. This was well below the top rates of other science fiction and fantasy magazines of the day. Okay. So even then one cent a word was not okay for them. Okay. The price of the magazine was increased to 20 cents in 1947 and again to 25 cents in 1949. Uh, the price of the magazine would go up and down in addition to changing the format, changing the size, changing the cover art, um, the Weird Tales folks tried everything to, to try to increase sales, and one of them was changing the price. But it was increased to 20 cents and then again to 25 cents. Uh, but it was not only Weird Tales that was suffering. See, this is around the time of the Depression, and the entire pulp industry was in decline during this period. So this negatively impacted sales, and in 1954, Weird Tales and Short Stories both ceased their publication. In both cases, the last issue was September 1954. There were, as I mentioned, according to my research, a number of failed attempts to resurrect Weird Tales from the mid-1950s on. Uh, a well-known publishing figure of the time, Leo Margulies, acquired the rights to both Weird Tales and short stories. However, he abandoned his plan to restart Weird Tales in 1962 he wanted to use reprints from the original magazine, um, but he was advised by Sam Moskowitz, who was an American writer, critic, and historian of science fiction, that there was little market for weird and horror fiction at the time. And again, to the writers out there, you'll notice that every complaint that uh, writers have, every concern that writers have, it's all cyclical. Everything is cyclical, and these things are just somewhat constants of the job of the business. So um, at the time, it was, it was said Moskowitz believed that there was little market for weird horror uh, and it, just weird fiction at the time. So instead, Margulies put together four anthologies in the early 1960s. He took the content from back issues of the Weird Tales magazines. And these four anthologies were The Unexpected, the Ghoul Keepers, Weird Tales, which I actually have seen in uh, used bookstores, and Worlds of Weird. Uh, I, I think it must have been fascinating to get your, get your hands on one of these anthologies. So these were the four anthologies that Margulies put out from back issues of the magazines. Uh, a new version of Weird Tales finally appeared from renowned publications in April of 1973, and Moskowitz edited it. The average sales, though, according to Moskowitz, were about 18,000 copies per issue. However, in order for the magazine to survive, they would have had to have sold about 23,000 copies per issue. The fourth issue, dated summer 1974, was the last one. Uh, after Margulies' death the following year, his widow, Sylvia, decided to sell the rights to the title. Okay, Now, Forrest Ackerman, who was... Uh, I think probably known to most uh, listeners of the podcast. Um, he was a science fiction fan and an editor and had you know, one of the largest collections of, you know, horror, science fiction and fantasy movie memorabilia in his house. Um, he was interested in buying weird tales, but she ultimately chose to sell to Victor Drix and Robert Weinberg, who, as I mentioned before, um, had a part in, in, uh, as, as a stakeholder in this magazine. Robert Weinberg then 
license the title to Lynn Carter, who was uh, a, a writer and editor at the time. Lynn Carter interested Zebra Books in a series of, again, four paperback anthologies. Uh, Lynn Carter edited them. The first two appeared in December of 1980 and were both dated spring 1981, but they, uh, they managed to put them out early. The next was dated fall of 1981. And then things got a little complicated. Uh, Carter's rights to the title were terminated by Weinberg in 1982 for non-payment. Uh, however, the fourth issue was already in the works. And finally, it appeared with a date of summer 1983. Following this, uh, to make a very long and complicated story somewhat shorter, uh, there was a lot of confusion and um, a lot of issues in between the two parties in trying to negotiate rights and licensing to the Weird Tales material. Uh, there was a lot of waiting for correspondence that didn't happen and, and things like that. And so during this time, only two issues, which sold poorly, uh, were published. The first was dated fall 1984 and the second winter 1985. However, that second issue didn't appear until June 1986. So uh, generally these are ind indications of, of trouble in, in a magazine circulation. Now, that's it for this week, for part one. Next week, we're going to cover the rebirth of Weird Tales because it did enjoy a resurgence. And this would be about the time that I came into the business. So this is the part that kind of excites me. There's also, I also have a number of interesting little trivia bits for you about Weird Tales and the people involved. So uh, that's it for this week. I hope you're enjoying this particular segment on Weird Tales and that you'll join us next week for part two. If you enjoy Cosmic Shenanigans, you might also enjoy another show I co-host, the horror show with Brian Keene. Both of them are available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and all other platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. Also, thanks to engineer Dave Thomas, you can watch his channel most nights at twitch.tv slash meteor notes. Thanks for listening. Bye. How do people who make stuff up for a living make stuff up? New York Times bestseller Jonathan Mayberry told us. <laughs> Oprah's book club favorite Sue Miller told us. You know, you sort of take a character and make some bad things happen. How'd we get them to do that? We colored them, just like at a cocktail party, except through your headphones. Join us every Thursday for the Liars Club Oddcast. A slightly unhinged podcast where storytellers interview other storytellers. Available on Project Entertainment Network, iTunes, and everywhere podcasts are heard. Thank you.